The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. group of participants starts with Alexander's very sprightly and yet somehow militaristic, um, you know, march-like uh, interpretation of Mussorgsky's The Seamstress. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's very cool. I like these little nuanced surges here. Um, yeah, and, and I, I like the beat. The regularity of it gets a little bit um, it gets a little bit too, maybe too paced because of the constant, uh, you know, the constant beat of the timpani. One thing that I would possibly suggest here would be to reverse the, um, the functions here. To have the bass drum be the timekeeper and have the timpani just hit a stroke at the beginning. And because the, what I find is that the... Um, the bass drum can carry that pulse without, um, you know, with, since it doesn't have a pitch, it doesn't sort of drive home the uh, the idea of the of the root of the chord over and over again as much as the timpani does. Do you see what I mean? So you could continue on with this pizzicato in the uh, double basses and accompany them with the bass drum and you know you'll still have that sort of paced feeling of regularity but it won't be quite as um you know it won't it won't drive it home so um so savagely do you know what i mean it, or or so repetitively it doesn't feel as repetitive so you have first and second bassoons but you're not telling me which bassoon is playing here right is this the first bassoon is this the second bassoon same thing here, flute one and two, okay, but you're not telling me whether this is one or two, right? Now here, of course, obviously this is two flutes playing and the first is on top and the second is on the bottom. In scoring, to be more precise here, you really would want the accent on both voices and the slur on both voices, right? Because they they really are separate voices and they need their separate... Uh, they need their their separate articulations. So yeah, so watch out for that if you do prepare this score uh, to be performed or read or something like that. It really does need. Now this is kind of strange. You've got this really long phrase mark, and then you've got this slur underneath it. So so don't do phrase marks on wind instruments. Just do just do just only slur when you are indicating what is going to be combined in one articulation. Why? When, in one articulated breath. Now, for oboe, the you know the whole breath could be like several bars long before they decide to breathe again. The whole point is though, like where does the articulation start and stop, right? So tongue, hold, tongue, continue to hold, tongue, right? So that you know, if we just take away this really long slur, and we just look at the tonguing, so it's tongue, tongue across here, and then tongue there. That's what you're saying with that, right? That's what that little slur mark means, right? So this very long one just confuses the issue. I mean, yeah, some Romantic era composers started just adding phrase marks to everything as a guide, but you, there's there's no need for that because everybody, I mean, especially with a piece this simple, it's just it's really obvious what is happening here, right? Okay, so um, everything else is just like, is either playing the pattern or it is kind of bumping on the beat or we've got these rolls in the harp. Now at the beginning, 
you know, like this first role is going to be heard beautifully, but this second role is going to just merge with the background and it will be very difficult to hear it at all, right? So, you know, against piano strings and winds and, and brass, this has got a chance. But once everything swells up to forte, this role will disappear as if it had never existed. It'll evaporate into the background. I mean, yeah, you, you might hear just a little bit of the, the tinkle of the fingers uh, as they ripple across the strings, but you won't really hear, um, you know, you won't actually hear the pitches, right? That glorious sound. So, you know, my, my instinct here is to, uh, you know, is to, to try to try to maybe either bring the, uh, the volume of the, the harp up, you know, to like say fortissimo, uh, or, you know, and even at that, it's not going to really compete very well. So, yeah. Um, uh, you know, interesting horn chords here. Uh, you say one and three and two and four. Now, a lot of people are using this. And it makes me almost wonder if people were looking at a template and saying, oh, you know, he's using one, three and two, four. Or should I do that? Um, in this case, you actually scored things out as if they were one, two and three and four, right? Because you've got the like this is a second horn part, right? This is first, this is second, this is third, not second, and this is fourth. So, so anyways, it's it's just, yeah. I mean, people are scoring one thing and then doing the opposite, right? So, so please, it, you know, learn about this. One, three, and two, four should not really be scored unless you really have a specific need because of the compression of the score and because of because you know because you just know that one and three are going to be playing big melodious a2 solos all the time right so but, but you don't have that in this situation you don't need to do that you don't need to you're not worried about vertical compression with lots and lots and lots and lots of staves just so that there's barely room to even put uh separate voices in the horns and stuff. You don't have that issue here. So really, this is one, two. This is a one, two part, and this is a three, four part. Okay. So we have the... Um, we have the... We have the melody instrument here. coming in and yeah so there really isn't like that opening B flat stated as its own note but we just have the accent to go along right all right and yeah and then just and then it just ties over to and changes over to uh, clarinet So yeah, so it's just really a a very set orchestration strategy, right? There's no there's no big change here, so it's kind of just the same thing happening again. Um, I mean, it's it's nice the intricate way that you are patterning everything. Okay, that's very cool. Now, what I'm worried about is by the time we get to this place, is where are the wind players going to breathe? Right now, you probably noticed in other arrangements, if you if you've been watching other scores here, that um, that like the the functions will be spread out amongst different instruments. Right, so like say, the top line will be uh, flute, and then the bottom line will be clarinet, and then the second flute will take over here, and the second clarinet will take over there, so that the players have time to breathe. Right. So anyway, so just you know consider that, <clears throat> and then. Onwards we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this will be... It's very strange the way that you got the... You got the first voice below the second voice. All right? This is really strange. It's the same thing here. So you've got Divisi, you got the... I don't know why this is, but, but it should be flipped the other way because this is just confusing. The higher player should be the 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 senior person on each desk in the violins, right? So a desk would be two people sitting side by side sharing a piece of sheet music, right? 
So generally speaking, the higher voice goes to the person um, who is higher, sort of higher in rank or status or whatever. So that in that case would be like the concert master would be sitting on the right, and then the con the assistant concert master would be sitting on the left. And so the the left player would be playing the lower part, and the the concert master would be playing the higher part, and that would be the same going all the way down the whole file of violin players, right? So so you got to you know this would have to be fixed before you finalize this score. All right, but it's basically so here you've got like a triple octave, right? You've got the cellos below, you've got the violins in the middle, and then you've got the flutes above. All right, so I mean that that does work because there's you know this is a nice sweet spot for the flutes but yeah i mean there there might have been more voices at play but it's good that some of these players are getting a rest yeah once again you know right in here these harp chords are going to disappear okay and this you know this pretty much works it's all good um there it's but you notice that there isn't any change right and we're still just underlining that downbeat or like or that baton stroke every single baton stroke is getting a timpani beat or a timpani note under it right so just very is very militaristic and it's the same with the the snare tattoo continuing on right and then here you do not you do not need to write out your harp glissando just write out the starting point and the ending point Right? And if the ending point is in the next bar, then just write it in the next bar. And then you just put a glissando mark and a pedal diagram telling the harpist what the tuning is. Right? And you don't need to write out all these notes. I mean, they're beautiful. And I have to say that, that you know, visually, a lot of orchestrators will write out the glissando just because they want to see all those notes rushing upwards. And it could be that the... Uh, the playback engine in their notation software doesn't have a plug-in that will supply all the notes. Sibelius does have a plug-in and it's very, very nice. Uh, that you can just program, you know, the, the endpoints of the uh, of the glissando and what the tuning is in the middle. So anyway, um, yeah, it's it's all very fun. I think by here, you know, you're really not indicating any kind of change of dynamic to the harp. This will be completely, yeah, this, you'll hear a little bit of this, but not much, right? Okay, well, look, it's a, it's a cool idea, and there was more. You, you know, you, you probably noticed that I had to fade out on additional music, uh, and it did kind of lead somewhere, and that was very, very cool. So, so Alexander, I think, it's a, I think it's really a great effort, and I'd be really interested to hear, you know, where you are going as an orchestrator, so please... Um, you know, for you and for everybody else in this challenge, really, I, I would just really love to see you uh, enter into the next challenge in 2020. I've got a great piece already picked out for that. And, and you know, just, just see what you do with that, because it's a very, very different piece from this piece, right? It's just a completely different vibe. And, and see how that challenge, you know, how that how you would respond to that challenge. Right. Um, but look, this is very cool. I mean, it's it's very, very much marching music. It's very marching music. It's very martial. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a great different take, unique take on this particular material. And and yeah, there's a lot of stuff to fix here. And a lot of that is just layout problems. And, you know, and, you know, just thinking about the players breathing and so on and so forth. But, you know, but but yeah, I mean, it's a really good first start, you know, um, uh, on you know first take on this material and you know worth developing if you can get somebody to read it all right and with that let's go on to the next entry Moving on now to Camille's very intriguing entry. It's there's a lot of things that need a little bit of fixing, but 
but it's you know it's still got some strong points to it and you know I, I just I found it really entertaining and and very creative so yeah so we're starting off here with three flutes and you know, the, the the staff size is tiny it's just really really small here so this is a case where you know if there are any extraneous staves just get rid of them if there's any part that doesn't you know that doesn't occur in the um, you know in the in the excerpt then just get rid of it you know what I mean um, and I've actually had to do that a few times when people submitted scores that had a full orchestra but the orchestra didn't come in till later in the excerpt and they were only submitting them submitting their entry um, as like a website entrant and so I had to sort of cut off you know cut off the rest of the score and then I just got rid of the extra instruments because that would make the staff size larger so if there's any way to make the staff size larger do you know what I mean that's really really it's very useful for everybody watching because like right here I can barely read flute one two and three so anyway okay so so this is playable um, you know at a, at a nice fast speed uh, this is playable and yeah you, you might want to make sure that you do like dotted like you 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 do your tempo marks on the dot there are a lot of people who are entering these scores and they're entering like quarter note equals something or other right but it's really the dotted quarter note where we assess the uh where the where the beat is right you're telling the conductor where to make the baton strokes right so bonk 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 and they're going to want to set that on their metronome to hear that they've got it right you know even i've, I've seen even pro uh, you know, really experienced pro conductors still carry around a metronome and just really, really make sure, you know, they want to nail that tempo exactly. Um, and nowadays, uh, there are so many composers who have non-standard tempos, like that that aren't exactly the same things that on, that's on a standard metronome. You know, things will be like, instead of 92, they'll be 90, right? But that tempo works exactly right for what's going on in the piece. So, yeah, so, so you know, go note dot equals when you're doing compound time all right okay um and then you know we just have this third flute just kind of uh bopping along here on the bottom and that's kind of cool and then we have the uh oboe come in here so it's just basically just all winds and that has a very nice bustling sound <laughs> excuse me <clears throat> and that's followed up with you know, clarinets coming in and playing chords and then taking over on the patterns. And that's all cool. But it sort of stays with the oboe in the same register, right? Uh, and then you've got that doubling with the wind. So so it does compensate a little bit. But it would have been interesting to, to hear like a, a sort of a change of timbre here, you know, whether, like as the doubling instrument. But you've got, you know, since you're using your clarinets, there is kind of no other option. You could have gone A2 with your oboes here since you are using them to uh to double the uh the violins then that would have made a nice rich uh a rich a seamless doubling i think this is kind of neat because it's, it's very massive and yet everybody is still very soft right it's that's all you know i mean i think you could have marked the dynamics up here quite a bit especially since you go into forte right here it's really a huge jump right Right here you have piano, and then this is continuing. You're, we're assuming this is still piano. And then here, forte, you just suddenly just blast in here with 10 different staves, right? Just, you know, all all suddenly picking up from the end of these flutes. So it, it's, a, it's a bit of an uneven uh, dovetailing here, right? Especially since things are mainly out of the same range as the flutes were. Okay, but going back to this... This is cool. Here I would have two harpists, right? I'd have one harpist playing the glissando, and then I would have the other harpist playing the plink, plink, plink. And, you know, that is, this is still possible on harp, but the thing that you have to understand is these, these strings will still be um, sort of vibrating because of the glissando, uh, you know, glissando crescendo, right? And then, um, then the harpist is going to have to play these strings, and they are going to buzz under their under her fingertips, under their fingertips, right? So yeah, so blum blum blum. So these notes right here are going to buzz as the player picks them out, right? Next page, we see those same sort of massive 
that same massive doubling going on. Now, just be aware that this kind of is kind of frantic and furious playing. You've got like you've got uh, you know off four horns, I guess, playing all of these pitches. And yeah, but I mean, your trombone, bass trombone, plus tuba. I'm just really, really trying to read this tiny little type over here. Yeah, so, yeah, so bass trombone and tuba a two right here. So, so yeah, I mean, this is this is the right way to do it. The held notes though will add gravity below everything else. So you you want to watch out for that. But you'll probably see that you know the lower winds make a nice even. Um, blended, uh, blended doubling with the um, with the strings, but you know these horns do not. <laughs> They're not, especially you know when you're bringing them up to sforzando and then having trills like horn trills have a certain uh, kind of rather explosive, rather uh, blurred effect. They don't have the same kind of sort of precision as string trills and wind trills. They have, they're very, um, you know, they, they really call attention to themselves. Uh, so, you know, so they're a very exaggerated effect. So everybody will be trilling, but these horn trills will just really just step out of the music. So you need to be aware of that. But, I mean, other than that, you know, I mean, it's, it pretty much works. Yeah, and, and once again, we have kind of an uneven dovetailing over into the other part, which is not too bad because, you know, because we do want to to really relax the music there. Now here, like you really should have marked this like maybe mezzo piano or, or mezzo or like or piano pianissimo even um, because you're, you know, it's just it's you have nothing but exposed as a completely exposed clarinet and horns there. Right. So they should be playing the same dynamic or. The horn should be under, and they don't need to do this diminuendo, right? What what is in the original part? Crescendo, diminuendo, right? So if this started off pianissimo, and that was piano, and you had the crescendo here, and then the diminuendo there, one of the reasons why your sound set sounds so like kind of very um, very blasty right there is partially just because you haven't changed the dynamics, right? You know, you've got. And it also, it's just it's just a very blaring sound, right? So yeah, I mean that that might be something worth looking into. I don't recognize, you know, I don't I'm, I don't know what every single uh, what every single sound set is or every single um, application notation application is by sight, but uh, but yeah, but if note performer works on your application, then it would be a good one. It would it would definitely tame a lot of those rough edges, right, and make it sound much more realistic. And then you you know you go on into this other direction, which I think is very cool with the harp and and everything else, and the you know I mean this is very similar to what happened before, but the the harp gives it this nice pacing um, that you know that isn't so um, you know it isn't it isn't so regular right it's just uh it's just more kind of evolving and unwinding so yeah so I, I think this is a really cool score and i really enjoyed giving it a look and yeah i mean you know like like i said with a lot of these scores you know like just keep working on them uh for your own improvement you know see how far you can take it maybe continue on towards the end or if there is a reading session for you know in your area like with with uh, you know like I say semi-pro or regional orchestra or something like that you know see if you know see if if one of these entries might make it into their reading so you can actually hear what it sounds like with real instruments it would be interesting to see but yeah definitely listen to some of the advice I'm giving you on all of these entries if that's your plan and see if there's something that you can do to kind of clean things up a little bit and get it more ready Okay, and we're not even into the whole question of extracting parts, right? Okay, and with that, let's move on to the third entry for this collection of evaluations.
our next score is from Demetrio, and I enjoyed this too. This was this was fun. Um, yeah, so so these <clears throat> these little staccatos uh, from oboe will will you know they they will ring out really nicely. The clarinets, you know, of course, are playing the octave. <clears throat> it's interesting though that there are no that there's no uh, pattern up here around the area of the oboes. It's just you know it everything is flute doubling the English horn. So the English horn can actually keep this going for a while uh, with no problem, especially at you know at a <clears throat> higher tempo like this. So that is not the big issue. The big issue is the fact that we've got this doubling of English horn in a <clears throat> in a more penetrating register being doubled by a single flute in a, a you know a fairly moderate register or even a weaker register, right? So so the I don't feel that this is a, the greatest blend. Um, I mean it'll you know the players can make it mix a little bit but there isn't any real timbral relationship between the two do you know what i mean so the the mixture is not going to have a it's not going to have a blended tone as much as it's just going to have like an added tone right so and then you're going to fade away here with your um uh, with your flute right into the english horn you know, as if just the English horn were just continuing on, right? Then you have the strings starting here, and that's fine. Um, suspended sizzle cymbal. That's kind of fun. The soft beater. So, yeah. Um, so you're assuming that this is going to last this long. You could just go like... Um, <clears throat> you could just have like a, uh, a tie with no, uh, with no further notes, right? Or if you really want it to last exactly two bars... I'm thinking, you know, tish. It'll just end anyways, you know, at about this same level. Okay, but, you know, soft, a soft stroke on the sizzle cymbal is not going to last very long. <clears throat> then you've got uh, first and second horn, muted. Okay, that's cool. Now, um, jumping ahead <clears throat> to the next page. We have more instruments jumping in. Now, I like this a lot. <clears throat> the um, the pizzicato being staggered, right? Not just not just playing on the first and second baton stroke of every single bar, but playing, you know, boom, boom, rest, rest, boom, 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 rest, rest, boom, boom. So I like that a lot. Um, doesn't. And then, you know, then you've got your glockenspiel um, taking the top there. And as we saw in in my lecture on my orchestration, there is definitely a relationship between glockenspiel and the overtones of the oboe. So this will have that, that nice kind of glinting sound, except that, like, when you put the piccolo in there, it takes it away somehow because the piccolo is sort of supplying it, right? So it's... The oboe tends to work with the piccolo, and the the effect is diminished in the glockenspiel. All right, it's still there, but it just doesn't have the same kind of juice. But I mean, you, you might want that too. <clears throat> it's this is an interesting effect here to to just double the first beat of each bar. You know, the first group of each bar. Yeah, and to sort of break up the pattern into the strings at a higher octave. <clears throat> that's also very fun and you know to just really let the the um the piccolo and oboe to play the uh, melody at two octaves apart uh with each other that is a neat effect i've got to say <clears throat> so you know the the only other thing here is just like you've got this harmony going in here with uh, bassoons and second clarinet, and that's you know that is nicely effective. You know, it's it's a good way of sort of filling in here. It's kind of like a horn pad, except with not the horns, with bassoons instead. And it's sort of taking the same general range that a horn would if it were doing a pad behind all of this. So so that's a that's a pretty effective 
Um, you know, and then, then just little touches of triangle to kick off each one of these uh, beam groups in the melody. That's, you know, that's, I feel that's pretty nicely done. <clears throat> it's a little deceptive because your sound set is not really that realistic, right? So um, I don't know what um, which notation app you're using, but you know, probably like if you're, I guess it's if you're using Finale, they're making it. I don't know if they'd make it for Finale, but I do think that they make it for Dorico now. So uh, the Note Performer, so it might be worth looking into if you're doing that. But anyways. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I mean, it could sound more realistic with the sound set, but like, we're not scoring to the sound set, right? It doesn't really matter to me. I'm just looking at the notes and telling you what will work and what won't. And this is kind of, this is a nice, you know, this is a nice, very light arrangement. Yeah. So going to the third page. <clears throat> We have that little episode, right, going up to here, and then, then the trill and sweeping down, and and I, I like the way that you've written this out for your trumpet player, right? Da 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 dum, that's nice. Um, the only danger that I can see here is that if your trumpet player has this notion that this is going to be a triplet descending down here to this written B natural which is actually sounding A, right? Is that since it is a such a penetrating instrument, it may it may kind of get everybody else to to go along with it to a certain extent, right? Or it make it might make the other instruments sound wrong to its right, right? Because it has more penetrating power. Um, this is interesting tish stroke, right? So it's not boom tish, it's tish then uh, then hit on the snare drum. This is completely not going to be heard. Like you've got this, you've taken pains to put in the the harp um, damping uh, effect, okay, which would actually go on the rest afterward. It wouldn't actually go on the note, right? Because like you, you, you're not going to damp something when you play it. You're going to damp something right after you play it, right? So the damping mark goes here. Um... <clears throat> At least that's how I've always seen it in parts. And and actually, it's the harpist who, you know, the harpist who usually makes the decision. But yeah, this is not going to cut through, right? It might cut through in your sound set if you sort of mix things up and stuff. But live concert situation with this much projection, mezzo forte crescendo into sforzando accent on a trill, the harp is going to disappear. So, it, you know, might as well just not even be there. Um... Yeah, so you've got your you've got your octave in your strings, and then you sort of stretch it out a little bit. Flutes, and I really like the way that you take that you go up instead of down in pitch here, right? So it's it appears to climb even though everything is descending. I like that a lot. That is that is a cool way of sort of rejigging it. But otherwise, you know, I don't really see anything, you know, anything too weird here. That's all going to work pretty much. And then you've got this Sforzando piano setting this up here. And I thought that this was really well done. This was nicely scored. Um, you know, the clarinets, uh, bassoon, and then, you know, horns working really, really well together. And just a little bit of muted trumpet. So... So here is where, you know, like, so you've got consort, 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 you know, with mute, right? Okay, so we're just going to back up here. You want no mutes, and then you want the player to put, the players to put on mutes in this, you know, within this amount of time. I would say just leave this note out. If you just ab absolutely have to have no mute, then just leave this out and then have them come in there. But, you know, who needs a mute? Why don't you just have them stop the notes? Do you know what I'm saying? I'm going to flick back here through your score. Why don't you just have this mute... Uh, sorry, um, uh, this is perfect range and, and perfect sound to stop, right? So just stop the tone. You'll, you'll get that very distant, kind of slightly snarly, tinny kind of sound. And then they can just take their hands out of the bell here, 
right? And then play this all open, and then just go to stopped here. And then you don't have a problem here with your trumpet, right? Um, having needing time to put on the mute because you just put it on here and then they play muted all the way through, right? Okay, and you don't need to remark. Like, like don't remark these kinds of things because you make the you make the conductor wonder, wait, did they put it on or not put it on or what's going on? Or if that was in the part, that would really confuse the player, right? Just mark it once. Okay, yeah, so stopped there. All right, that ought to work. <clears throat> And this is nice. The English horn scoring is nice. And then you're kind of going back into it here. Kind of the same strategies as before. So, so yeah, so very fun, uh, very fun, satisfying arrangement here. I, I liked it a lot, Demetrio. And, um, yeah, you know, there are a few things to fix in this and stuff. And, and hey, you know, really would love to see you um, participate in the next challenge. That would be awesome to see where you're getting with your with your orchestration and, and your ideas and, and you know how it, how the next piece is going to strike you because it's going to be a very striking piece. Pretty amazing piece that we're going to be orchestrating next year. So, um, so thanks very much. Now, on to our next entry in this group of D orchestrations. Now, uh, for Carl's orchestration. Now, Carl, I don't know if you're a percussionist or not, um, but this snare drum part seems um, seems a little um, dubious. Like, I would say use two different snare drums, right? So you want um, a strike above the line, and then you want to scrape. You want to sort of like a swishy kind of a scrape with the um, with the other hand. Uh, and um, I'm just you know I'm kind of doing that in my head as like my feeble percussion skills. I mean I think that that I think it's possible with one, but it's just you know I just don't know how clear that would be. Do you know what I mean? Maybe maybe what you really mean here is to have a shaker, right? It's like like there could be um, like a just a regular brushes hit and then a then like a shaker on a second on a second percussion instrument anyway um if you were trying to economize there it's okay i mean you could have you could write it out and then you know then trade over at another place all right um now we could we could kind of hear in that sound set once again you know there there are some sound sets that are um you know they're a little um you know, a little bit more mechanical, um, a little less realistic than others. And we could kind of hear in that sound set, like a very, very quick alternating pitch kind of comes across almost like, um, uh, you, you know, almost, almost like very, very difficult to distinguish that they are musical tones, right? You know, do you know what I mean? So just watch out for that. If you, if you need to make more realistic mock-ups um for production you know or you know to, to convince a director or or you know like even okay this is this is something i mean i i don't even need a mock-up i could do this entire um evaluation with without listening to it just just looking at the score and hearing inside my head okay but i'm sharing these mock-ups because i want the people watching these uh these evaluations to you know to sort of hear for themselves like kind of what the general idea of what the arranger heard and also i want to hear that too just kind of to see if there were any things about the um the mock-up that sort of guided you in a certain way so probably not in this case i would assume but uh but yeah but i mean i've had um you know i've gotten work because of mock-ups right just you know um just like sent a mock-up to to somebody who needed it, right? Who was not a conductor who could audiate the same way as me. Just look at a score and hear it in their head, right? So, 
All right, so back to the score. Anyways, I'm just saying, like, fix your, you know, see if you can get something better. Now, as far as this is concerned, like the, um, the accent and the slur, I don't think you can say sim. You know, I think that most, uh, you know, as repetitive as it may look, I think that most players would prefer to see the articulation and the and the slur on every beam group. All right, so I don't think that is something you can just sim your way out of. Um, maybe simile for the accents, right? But I think that you can't simile slurs, right? Slurs should always be marked, at least um, with the way that I score. There are some nice touches here. Um, I love the speed, and uh, you know I love these clarinets and flutes working together. And once again, you know, we we see the oboe being used as the as the melody instrument. In this case, uh, in octaves with the with the first horn, and that's that's a beautiful sound. Very um, you know very Stravinsky. And Stravinsky liked to to do combinations of oboes and horns. It really work well together, and is is not the most obvious thing um, to you know to all composers, but we do see it quite a bit in certain. Uh, musicians. Now here we've got this unison, um, a two horns plus first bassoon. Yeah, I, you know it, you're going to pretty much just hear the horns if you do that, right? It'll, I mean, if you had a two bassoons and one French horn, then you would get a blended sound, right? But this is just going to be horn plus the you know a little bit of bassoon. All right, and then this is kind of nice harp there's you know by the way there's very little dynamic marking anywhere right so just please check that before you submit right so so we know put in dynamic nuances right is does this just go bum ba ba bum or does it go bum ba ba bum right i'd really like to know right what what, what that idea was like we have a few hairpins here or there right but yeah um you know you do not have to put a niente mark at the beginning of a roll, you know, you, you know, if you just put a triple P on that, you're going to get the same exact effect anyway, right? I would say really save the niente mark for specific atmospheric textural effects, okay? And don't just throw it around like it was just a, a very ordinary thing for a timpanist to start from a niente, right? This just means triple P to, to most timpanists, right? So, so just write a triple P. Right? Don't, don't, I would say save Niente for things where it is absolutely, there is no other possible marking that you could use, right? And what instruments use that? You know, like, well, I guess you can do a roll from Niente on timpani and say, like, um, uh, strings can start from Niente and go back into Niente. Uh, same thing with clarinets and, like, there are saxophone subtones and there's, like, uh, low register flute. But, you know, just speaking in a global sense, it's a, it's a very rare mark, and it's something that you shouldn't just use indiscriminately, right? All right, that's my Niente lecture for today, unless I see a whole bunch of it in, uh, in, in another score. All right, and then, you know, leading to that furious uh, little episode, uh, which was pretty cool. You know, I love this bam, just right here, just kind of like, smashing on the door and yeah I'm just quickly looking through that that's gonna work pretty good I might accent the strings just so that they have a little bit more of a chance against the brass and same thing with the like same thing with the winds I might give them an accent here now are you really sure I uh, okay so I'm remembering that you said simile with yeah see this is the problem you can't just you just can't assume simile on everything right because I'm looking at this as a score reader possibly you know maybe as a conductor looking at this and saying wow do you really want the flute the first flutist to tongue every single one of those notes taka 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 right and then remember oh right there was a simile marking do you see how do you see how confusing that marking can become if you leave it out Right, so don't do that. Don't don't assume that simile takes the place of slurs. All right, because it just really shouldn't. All right, it, and then what do you do when you get to here? 
right? Just assume that every time you have a beam group, you're going to have a slur, right? You can't assume anything. So put in all the slurs, all right? That that's that would be the, and then you've got slurs here. Like the conductor is going to going to be asking, why are there slurs on the violins and not on the winds, right? So why are there not, right? Okay, I like the fact that you didn't trill. There's been a lot of trilling of, of brass, and I don't, don't don't think that it is actually going to sound the way that some arrangers feel that it is going to. So um, in some arrangements, it looks like it would. Some others, it's, you know, anyways. So we've got our big bass drum. Okay, I think that's all going to work out pretty well. You know, it might be nice to have alternating hits, you know, timpani, bass, because the bass drum forte accent is going to cloud the sense of pitch here. I really, by the way, I really do like the, um, I do like the harmony, the way you've sort of re, um, kind of reinterpreted the harmony for this passage. I think that's very cool, right? And then we just go back to here. Now, now here's another place where I felt that the, um, your sound set sound just kind of is doing you no favors. Like your, your bassoons basically sounded like horns, like kind of cheaper horns. All right, so so I don't know. Maybe look into like if Note Performer is available for your your app or some other kind of you know inexpensive but good sounding solution that you know that would really help a lot if you need to make you know if you need to make demos with more realistic mockups. So if you don't need to, then don't worry about it. I mean, I don't. I almost never need to, but but it really helps to have Note Performer. Um, or other solutions when I need them. Sometimes I'll do a mixture of different sound sets coming out of Sibelius. All right, this is kind of neat. One last little comment here. Uh, sticks, buzz stroke, rim shot. That's really fun. The rim shot may create a um, like a reverb effect in the hall that sort of drowns out what's going on here. You know, if it if it's loud enough, and it's hard to do a rim shot without having a kind of a snappy sound, right? Without having an accent. So watch out for that, I would say. Anyways, aside from that, really fun. Um, and, and you know, it, it's, I mean, it still needs to be worked on a little bit. Um, yeah, but I mean, but it's still pretty cool. And, uh, and, you know, nice work. On to our next entry. Our next arrangement is from Ming Shi, and I really have to say I love the proportions of this particular entry. Um, I think it's pretty well thought out. I think that it's got some great scoring for the particular sections. Like, you know, I, I feel that this is really good wind scoring. You know, I mean, it's. I don't think you need to go a two here with the oboe. I think a single oboe is going to be fine. When you have a two oboes like this, you get a very trumpet-like sound. Like it, it's it's a, um, and it and it lacks um, it lacks delicacy and grace. Do you know what I mean? It's 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 um, kind of has a hard edge, right? And it kind of kind of takes away the oboe ness of it. If you are able, you know, if you've already got so many other instruments doubling here, right? You've got um, you've got flute and clarinet doubling, so you don't really need a two on the oboe here, okay? Um, this is probably not needed, this mezzo piano to mezzo forte, and then back again. So why not just have, you know, you just get rid of that and just have a hairpin going to mezzo forte and coming back. The player will play to the to the dynamic of the rest of the you know, of the rest of the instruments. You don't have to specify a um, an origin dynamic, like a starting dynamic, um, you know. And, and mezzo piano to mezzo forte is like almost nothing, you know. It's blah to blah. Do you know what I mean? It really doesn't, it doesn't make that huge of a difference 
to the player. Like if you start, if you went piano to mezzo forte, that would actually have something of an arc, right? And it would be more true to everything else that's going on here. But I think you, all you have to do is just put a little hairpin and you'll get the right effect. So I would say just get rid of that, put in a hairpin, make it just a single oboe, and I think you'll have a beautiful, uh, beautiful blend right there. Because, I mean, look at look over here, you know, like you've got A2, same thing here, you've got A2 clarinets. You don't need two clarinets. Like here you've got five instruments playing that, you know. I mean, it would be easier, like you've got a single flute here, and then you have A2 clarinets fading in and out. Easier just to do a single clarinet, I would say. Because like the, like the two clarinets put together will have like a sort of a, um, they'll kind of kind of have an edgy sound. Like a, a kind of a slightly uneven sound. Okay, I like the bass clarinet. You have two bass clarinetists, right? You have to say how many you have at the beginning, right? This part right here should say, um, right? Right? Two bass clarinets in B flat. That's not really within the scope of the challenge, but it's all right. You I mean you just you didn't realize that you scored anyway. So this is kind of neat. You've got um, you've got like a pulse in the in the long slur, right? So the so the player is going to go da right? They're not going to go ta ta ta. So maybe you weren't anticipating that, but yeah, but and and but here, like when you have a new instrument coming in, like a new voice coming in, there is no way to get around the fact that they have to articulate with their tongue here. So there is no need to overlap on the slur like you've done on all these, because there's you know you'll hear the overlapping of the breath from one instrument, but you'll hear the articulation from the other, and the articulation is always going to win, right? So there's no need to, you know, if you have an articulation like this, where, you know, the other instrument starts in a, such a regular way, there's really no need to, to do this crossing thing. I see how you're trying to tie everything together with these little parts in the clarinets that come and go, but yeah. Anyways, but I just think that this is a, a lot right in here, to have two clarinets, two oboes, and a flute all on this one pitch, right? I think I think it'll work better if it's leaner, if there's just one pitch each, right? Okay, so, yeah, continuing on. I mean, it's really fun wind scoring, right? If you can, like, if you, let's say that this was all first clarinet, right? Everything you've written here is first clarinet. Then what you can do is you can have one of these parts be second clarinet trading off with the bass clarinet, and you don't need two bass clarinets, right? That way you're still down to the amount of instruments that you're going to do. Now, what is this? Is this A2? Is this one? What is this? It does only needs to be a single uh, bass clarinet. In this kind of sort of free wind scoring, it's better to have like single voices interacting with each other than to have them kind of grouped together because then you always are kind of worrying about balance, right? Do you know what I mean? So better just to have this to sound like a sextet or a septet rather than to sound like, you know, um, doubled winds on everything. Okay, so other other than those picky, picky little things, I, I like this a lot. Uh, key signature and the timpani, you know, some timpanists say they like them. Most timpanists I've ever talked to don't like them. So, you know, watch out if you're putting key signatures in your timpani all the time. Here on the second page, we get into the episode. Right, which you have scored um, in the octave with violins and violas. A second violin coming in to bulk up the bulk up the first violins. Why not the cellos coming in to bulk up the uh, the the violas? Right. That way you you, know, you get more force below. Here you've got the trumpet on top. A2. Now, once again, I think you just need one trumpet player here, or maybe one trumpet player trading off. You just be aware in these long, smooth passages for trumpets. Trumpets, you know, like brass, do play beautiful slurred stuff, but it is not, it is doesn't have that same smoothness that you might be thinking of 
from strings and and winds. Uh, yes, it is smoothly connected, but it isn't the same kind of smoothness. Do you know what I mean? It is a, it is a smoothness that uh, you know that has a that definitely has an edge to it. All right, when you when you have these long slurred passages for for the uh, brass now. You know, mezzo piano to sforzando. It just would be better. Why not just start from piano, right? Piano is a place to start from, right? Mezzo piano, mezzo forte, going back to mezzo, mezzo piano. Just make make the outsides piano and the inside mezzo forte. Then you're actually going somewhere. Do you know what I mean? As opposed to, um, as opposed to just like going from you know from a little soft to a little loud or a little soft to a little loud to an accent and back to a little soft it's sort of like kind of make up your mind do you know what i mean you 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 have to just really you know you have to commit to something mezzo dynamics don't commit to anything right they're very default uh you know they're they are the wrong default to use if you're defaulting to things De a good default is p or f right there are almost no F's in this entire piece. There's Sforzando, right? But like there are almost no F's in this piece. There are some P's, some piano. But yeah, but there's so much mezzo forte and mezzo piano. I think you should just clean this up, right? Just change the, your mezzo pianos to piano and just see how it works. That way the, the dynamics will actually flex. They'll like a muscle, you know, they will actually go somewhere and do something. All right. So I'll stop harping on that. But I'm just seeing, you know, once again, I've been lecturing about this for years. Please go easy on your mezzo dynamics. Okay, now here we have a very bulked up A2 scoring. And I think I, I, I think that that will work pretty well. And I'd like the bassoon coming in here to double up the viola line. And here's where I would definitely put in some cello, right? You have almost no cello in this, in this arrangement. So here would be a great place to put in the cello right to just double that and make it stronger because you know, otherwise you just have one string line in the the weakest string you know the weakest member of the string family is carrying the entire bottom line right so you got to do something about that might even be better just to give this to the cellos and then have the violas come in right here to bulk things up the same way that the seconds do yeah, that would be the smoothest possible um approach so anyway um, yeah, and then, and then just, uh, this is, this is fine. The, uh, you know, I would say just piano here, you know, you're thinking, oh, here, here we got a crescendo. So they're coming in in the middle of the crescendo. So they should be mezzo piano. No, they should be piano. All right. That way they will come out of the string texture rather than just suddenly starting on a, you know, like you'll hear them come in clunk, right? Have them come into, like, insinuate themselves into the string texture gently, right? So they could even start a pian pianissimo and then come up to sforzando and come back down again. Now, that would be the smoothest of all. Okay. All right, so so very cool arrangement. I, I like this a lot. I had a lot to say about it and lots of picky things to say, but I, I really do think that you've got some gifts there, Ming, and I'm really enjoying, you know, the... Um, you know, just kind of seeing your orchestration and 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 would really be interested to see what you, um, if you're able to submit next year, it would be really great to see. Anyway, on to our very last entry for this D group of entries to the orchestration challenge of 2019. Our last entry for the D group is from Pauli, and what a cool arrangement! I mean, it's it's not just that this is very professional sounding and and everything else, but it just has such a fun 
uh, as a fun approach. Do you know what I mean? A little bit of this, a splash of that, but and yet very integrated approach to the orchestration. Uh, I'm hearing so much glockenspiel that I'm starting to get very used to it, but it just was perfect here as as a you know a unison accompaniment to piccolo and yeah and and this this beautiful harmonization here from the uh <clears throat> from the upper winds that was just all very lovely and then of course i mean this is the first uh the first entry for this challenge that has had anvil in it and it just really has that harmonious blacksmith sound to it um which is funny because you know a seamstress and a blacksmith would be kind of like the um would have very similar jobs in that society of the 1860s 1870s uh around the time that this was written you know they'd both be artisans who were you know whose craft was essential for the operation of a village you know if you wanted to wear nice clothes you would have to have them repaired by the seamstress if you wanted to or or, or sewn by the seamstress if you wanted to um, have your ox cart remain in working condition you would have to take it to the blacksmith so i, I just love the that kind of relationship i think that's very cool and also there's there's a sense of just the mechanical sound in general you know could be a very clunky sewing machine doing its job so that's that's i love that context there that's very fun and then I love this muted trumpets and then the muted trumpets returning you know, just a touch right here and then returning in harmony, right? And I, and I also love the changing of context of harmony uh, when the, when the uh, piccolo comes in, right? Uh, that's just, you know, it's just really, really lovely um, the way that it was all done. The only possible... Um, fly in the ointment here is that that is a long time for the clarinetist to be playing without taking a breath. I think that it's possible. It's just, you know, it's just a bit long. So they would probably have to sneak a breath right in around here. Um, so yeah, that's what, that's what I would probably do or probably tell them to do if I were working with maybe a semi-pro group. So anyway, I'm thinking more and more like a conductor nowadays just because you know, um, a lot of times I have to kind of take charge or put myself in the place of the conductor as I orchestrate. So, it, you know, so as to sort of save the conductor time later on. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's it's a little bit like, you know, Robert Kraft showing up and rehearsing an orchestra and then having Stravinsky come in and then do the rehearsal. Sometimes a concert orchestrator has to think like an assistant conductor. So anyway, but yeah, the harp is all pretty effective. I think it should be scored at like at forte because, you know, I mean, that's just the realistic, that's the, that's the reality here. And then you have the piano, just the piano ting of the glockenspiel. It's probably going to be closer to, you know, it's probably going to have to balance, you know, to balance it's going to have to be just a little bit louder. So... Yeah, but everything else works really, really great on this first page. And now here we are going into the um, that little octave melody. And as the melody goes up, the lower note is doubled by the first clarinet. And that turns it into a triple octave with the second clarinet on the bottom, which just kind of takes us to this here. And this is interesting that the resonance of the clarinet kind of fills in the missing notes here not not exactly but just the kind of the shininess of it uh and then you know with the uh flute and oboes so i just feel that the this sort of trading off of register registers works seamlessly because just because of the um because the resonance of the instruments is complementary right across different registers all right and it helps to have these little punches here from uh, horn, muted horn here. This could also be stopped and trumpet and back along with a bit of pizzicato. It's, it's kind of interesting. There's very, you know, there's almost no strings in this arrangement. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, 
but I just, you know, I love this little interplay in here, you know, the, like flute and bassoon. Um, this is a beautiful classic uh, combination. We see it in Beethoven, like there's a famous passage in the Ninth Symphony, which is in my woodwinds course. And then Mozart also did this Haydn, uh, played the triple octave, um, sometimes with the, um, well, sometimes it would just be like bassoon, two octaves below, flute above, or there would be like an oboe in the middle. Here we've got two flutes and then bassoon below, but it'll still have the same kind of sound. And then here, this is great. The, um, the dovetailing into the piccolo line here, oboe taking over, right? And then see this relationship here of the oboe and the piccolo at octaves. It's beautifully, um, very glowing, uh, uh, resonance there. And then of course, both instruments are being doubled by the clarinet. So that's just a, that is a wonderful combination right in there. Very good wind scoring here. Okay. Um, that's going to be a pretty big climb, but I mean, it's not too bad, you know, starting on a written E flat going up to F and, you know, good player will play, you know, just play that for breakfast, lunch, and dinner little tricky for like maybe a semi-pro or, you know, kind of like good student player who'd have to practice up on it, but it's still really, it's still very possible. Then here we got like first clarinet and bassoon. This is a very Russian sounding combination in these registers. Okay, going down into the throat tones and this going down into the, the, uh, the upper low register. All right, and then continuing on down into the Chalamot register with the flute coming in on top of that is also a very wonderfully effective combination. And I just really love the way that this stops right here, right on this uh, written G, giving a punch to the sforzando of this flute G, and then allowed to turn on, to continue on with just simple bassoons below. So you can see that a lot of this scoring is is simplicity itself. You know, it's it's um, it's not complex, it's not heavily textured, it's not, you know, um, some of it's not very finely worked out, and yet it, you know, it's hard to make a very simple arrangement work, you know, and, and just very, just very much glow and stand out, right? And here, here's that, some more support to that G right there, that pizz, that pizzicato note right on the same G. So it, it all works out pretty well, just because the balance and the, and the complement of the register works works great. So yeah, so it's just, yeah, it's actually a really great way to bring this uh, second group of evaluations to a close. And yeah, just really am enjoying these website evaluations. And once again, you know, people obviously could keep going and, you know, get quite a bit out of it uh, and, you know, possibly score the entire piece. And maybe they have, you know, maybe, um, you know, maybe Pauli Martinin's um, version of this is going to be the new standard, right? Uh, how do I know? But you know, it's it's very convincing and very fun, and and a great uh, a great excuse for your percussionist to drag out their anvil and start pounding on it with a metal hammer. So those kinds of things are always really fun for percussionists. So great arrangement, actually great group of six arrangements in this video. I'm very glad that everybody sent, uh, sent in those arrangements and had things that I could talk about and help out with. So um, yeah, so that's all for this video, but the E group of evaluations should be coming up very soon.